Great, thanks very much, Stephanie. I appreciate the nice introduction and thanks to everybody who is uh, signed on and is listening at home. There are, uh, I'm sure, a number of uh, friends and colleagues out there. So uh, greetings from uh, <clears throat> what is soon to become a very rainy and stormy Houston. Uh, so if you hear thunder in the background, that's just me. So um, I think Stephanie also probably didn't give a big enough pitch to the people at the bottom of your screen uh, to next week's webinar. There are some good friends there, uh, Tim Shipley from Temple, Nicole Ledoux from Northern Illinois, and I think uh, Stephanie's prior, prior um, PhD advisor and, and friend, Mike Rudinsky. And so I think uh, all of them will continue this series. And so I'm going to hopefully today, uh, in my portion of this, not only set up Claire's uh, talk, which will be in great detail, she's done some fabulous work on uh, seismic interpretation, but also give some general background, which will hopefully launch um, this series. So um, without any further ado, I'll keep going. Let's see, switch over. There we go. So um, we had to put a fairly broad title on this, uh, Geoscience Education Research at the Post-Secondary and Professional Level to distinguish um, the great body of research that's been done in the K-12 arena um, and also really thinking about, uh, you know, we're, we're kind of walking away from that, also maybe walking away a little bit from some of the non-majors and um, uh, other specialty audiences like pre-service teacher at educational research. Uh, we really wanted to take the opportunity with this audience uh, to focus on what we can do at the undergraduate, graduate, and then working professional levels, and what research has been done and what research um, we're, we're hoping to do, hopefully with your collaboration. Um, it's fabulous to talk to the IRIS community. Uh, my background is in, uh, my PhD is actually in mineral physics uh, from UC Riverside, and I am a self-trained uh, geoscience education researcher, but I've made my career in that. And so I've always considered myself a structural geologist and a fan of seismology in all of its forms, uh, especially when I was studying deep earthquakes and uh, mechanisms to generate fractures at unusual depths. So <clears throat> it's, um, it's nice to be speaking with this community and uh, the IRIS community has always been a big supporter of geoscience education work. So um, moving on, um, I, I thought it might be useful to provide some context in terms of uh, how geoscience education reached its current place. Um, it's gone through a number of uh, really significant evolutions through time. And uh, what you see here is my construction. I've got, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, there are lots of other constructions like this out there, but uh, you know, it's my lived experience and also looking back at how we got to, to be this field. Um, I, I put it into four waves and it's really probably better thought of as a cladogram really where you have uh, common ancestors and all of these, all these types of people still exist and still operate in the uh, geoscience education world. It's just become richer and bigger. Um, so uh, I think geoscience education really started as it continues with, with just excellent practitioners, um, thoughtful teaching um, and, and careful assessment of student learning outcomes. And that was it manifested itself in the Journal of Geological Education, which ran under that name, as you can see in the dates up until 1995. There's a long history there, um, really pretty much is even longer than the, uh, the modern sort of unifying theories of plate tectonics and the rest. Um, Around in the mid 90s, you started to see a more, uh, I think, rigorous and more purposeful interaction with education researchers. And we started to see geoscience become an interesting content area to those researchers. And there started to be some better interactions and increasing methodology, uh, quality of methodology applied to geologic teaching. Um, I was, that's where I got swept into this. And um, I was then part of the third wave. And a number of my you know, colleagues that are now finding themselves at the more senior end of their career or mid-career people actually started off in discipline and uh, were then ultimately hired into disciplinary uh, faculties, into disciplinary departments um, as education researchers. And so there are quite, there was a substantial cohort of us that earned promotion and tenure and still continue doing our primary research in discipline-based education research inside geoscience departments. And so that was really, I think, the line where uh, geoscience education research um, joined the DBER field, and I'll have a slide that'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and we have also now started generating plenty of graduate students, doctoral as well as masters, and they've moved on into the world. And so Nicole Ledoux next week is one of these fourth wave people who actually enjoys a formal geologic background in terms of professional level education at the graduate level, as well as um, formal education and educational research methods. And so I think we're looking at the beginning of an explosion of expertise 
uh, in this field. And I think we're starting to see the sophistication and applicability and predictability of our findings starting to match um, the, the fields that we're studying in the geosciences. So the intent of geoscience education research is really fundamentally to demonstrate increasing quality, improving the reach and impact of our instruction, and also to reach a broader and increasingly diverse audience and to know that we're doing it well. Um, our field presents a number of interesting um, field-specific, domain-specific uh, domain uh, cognitive tests and uh, other kinds of, uh, uh, you know, say, field environments, other kinds of you know, three-dimensional thinking, just as examples. Uh, these are conceptual and cognitive difficulties that are unique, uh, that, that aren't as well represented in other science fields. And so, um, you know, systems thinking is another example. So this is something that has uh, been a cornerstone of geoscience education research. Uh, we've also got a strong workforce preparation um, motive. As a past president of AGI, I feel sort of uh, duty bound to mention that uh, you know workforce projections are still looking um, looking a bit tight for the geosciences, and so we have an imperative to make sure we're reaching as many people as we can. Um, finally, we have joined the wave of discipline-based education research. What that means is we're we're now right there with you know physics, chemistry, biology, astronomy, engineering, mathematics. Uh, the geosciences were highlighted in the NRC document that you see here, published in uh, 2012. That's the U.S. National Research Council. Um, and what characterizes discipline-based education research is this. Um, you, ha you have researchers that are fundamentally grounded and thoroughly professionally educated in the discipline, and then at, at least the master's level, and then apply, um, you know, all the best of... Uh, in educational research and other kinds of methodological tools to advance the field for the intent of uh, undergraduate, graduate, and professional education. So this is an exciting time to be in this field. Um, it's pr definitely posed some interesting theory and method issues. Um, this is a, a, a major concern in education research because the, um, the, the theoretical approach, the methodological approach you use in terms of what you admit as data um, and how you deal with that data has implications on how you understand your results. And so this is something that we've borrowed from the education research uh, tradition. Um, and also, uh, you know, we, we also draw on cognitive scientists. We draw on learning scientists. Uh, we, we draw linguistic and cultural theory. I'll show you a little bit of that in a minute. And um, we also draw on educational and social psychology. So. Um, typically, you know, geoscientists, uh, we will, you know, we, we steal whatever methods work from wherever and apply them carefully to our problems. But it, it is fundamentally a mixed methods uh, venture. And so we're seeing hybridization of theory and method uh, that it's very common, but it's also quite challenging intellectually to make sure and productive, uh, just to make sure that what we're doing is rigorous and uh, hangs together theoretically. So that's, uh, that's been another interesting journey over, say, the last 20 years as our field has matured. So uh, what have we done? Uh, where are we? Um, back in uh, 2015 at uh, the Earth Educators Rendezvous, uh, sh shamelessly advertised down at the bottom of this, this is a gathering of Earth Science Educators and among them Earth, Earth Science Education Researchers. We got some funding from the National Science Foundation uh, to have a workshop as a field synthesis uh, to really uh, pull together as a group and say, okay, what do we know? How well do we know it? And what do we want to know next? And so what we found from that uh, effort was that we have a fairly, um, we, we have a, a reasonable selection of concept inventories and a good set of papers uh, documenting conception, growth of conceptual understanding. Um, we, we're certainly, we don't have anything like the physics concept inventory really. Um, you know, and geoscience concepts are a bit slippery, as it turns out. They're very contextual. Um, oftentimes, they have a lot to do with lived experience. And so it's been an interesting adventure uh, there. We still have more work to do at, at sort of the basic mapping of what strange things people do think and don't think about the earth sciences, but that's an active area of research. Um, there's misconceptions on how to avoid them. The spatial and temporal thinking has been a major area of research interest lately. And that's why uh, next week when you hear from Tim Shipley, he will no doubt tell you much more about this than, uh, than, than I should. Um, but uh, it's become clear that geoscientists use uh, three-dimensional and four-dimensional thinking in a way that is very unusual among uh, scientists. We share three-dimensional rotations with chemists. We share spatial thinking with um, astronomers and physicists in some cases. But 
geoscientists bring to the table um, a, a really a wide array of uh, spatial abilities and skills that um, cognitive scientists have found fascinating to explore. So as, as a domain group, uh, we are of great interest to them because we're, we're, we're a group of people that uh, on the average uh, seems to do these types of skills differently. How you teach them, however, is still something that we are discovering how to do. It is possible to teach these skills, but it is, uh, it, it is not clear always how. Um, one other area where the geosciences are, um, are, very, in, are very unique among discipline-based education researchers is in problem solving, reasoning, and ill-defined problems. Uh, we are, that's our stock and trade, uh, from geophysics to geology, um, oceanography, you name it, all the fields of the geosciences, ill-defined problems are what we do. And so um, there's been some interesting crossover into the expertise literature and the tools to look at expertise in terms of behavior, in terms of uh, attention, perception, um, in terms of uh, cognitive structure and conceptual structure. And so I'll, I'll touch on that a little bit briefly, and that's certainly relevant in terms of how one processes, say, reflection seismology or does interpretation. Likewise, teaching with models, simulation, and visualizations has become a bigger deal as more programs have moved online. And as, how, as computer technology has become cheaper and more ubiquitous, these types of things become very handy, especially in dealing with things like temporal and spatial thinking. Uh, instructional strategies across the board, uh, the field environment in particular, I would highlight here, has been uh, is an interesting and again, once somewhat unique uh, component of our disciplines. Um, not as many uh, not as many scientists get out into the out into the world and do their science in a very observational and historical context, uh, or experimental even in the field. So this is something that is an active area of research. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, Affective domain, this is how one feels about your confidence, your attitude, um, it, it determines persistence. This turns out to be a fairly substantial area. There, there has been a lot of research done in geoscience ed on this, probably especially mostly through the late 2000s and into the early 2010s, because um, real, we realized it was tied to uh, recruitment, uh, diversity, persistence, and a lot of other uh, reasons to look at this, and it influences uh, science identity formation. We've also discovered there are cultural and linguistic factors that really matter in terms of how you frame ideas, oftentimes connected to spatial and temporal thinking, which is quite interesting. So um, as, as we've uh, borrowed tools from uh, social scientists on this, it's been fascinating to, uh, to see how that replies to the geosciences. And finally, we're always still trying to develop, do exactly this, like this webinar. We're trying to figure out how best to uh, communicate what we know to our colleagues and help uh, help the rising tide float all boats in terms of uh, funneling our, our findings back into the community to benefit teaching across the board. Uh, the geosciences among all the discipline-based education research fields, I think, has a disproportionately good reach into our home communities because the geosciences are relatively small and we are a relatively large piece of that small community, as it turns out. There's a lot of interest in our community. And so the findings from research tend to get uh, uh, act, you know, turned into practice fairly quickly wherever it's possible. So finally, um, all of this, if you want to read the long form of this, uh, that really long, ugly link right there is where you can actually go find the full report from this workshop and all the attendant web pages. And I'm sure I'm happy to make these slides available or we can post that link separately afterwards. Um, otherwise, I'd encourage you to take a look at the Earth Educators Rendezvous in 2017. If, if you like what you see, in these next two, uh, in this week and uh, next week's webinars, I would encourage you to join us in Albuquerque. Uh, this has become a big and now a somewhat sustaining event, and it's uh, it's in its third iteration. Uh, about 300 people come of all stripes of geoscience educators, and including increasingly atmospheric scientists and oceanographers, so and geographers as well. So it's been wonderful to see this broadening of interest and uh, a meeting that's specifically about education and not just buried in the context of AGU or GSA or AAPG. Uh, it's nice to have a standalone meeting, so come and join us. Okay, so what am I talking about in terms of spatial skills? This is one of the classic kinds of spatial skills tests. I'm not going to get into this in any kind of detail. There are a number of studies that uh, have, uh, I had one student working on this, and uh, there's been a number of other smarter people than me working on this. But this is kind of what I mean by the kinds of tasks that uh, geoscientists have to do, both geophysicists and geologists. Uh, we have to be able to think in terms of cross sections. That's just the nature of the game. Um, and how people do that has been an area of investigation literally for the last 20 years. Um, 
we're finding that there are sort of a U-shaped distribution of abilities, but people can be moved on this scale, and so it is possible to teach this. And uh, so this is uh, still an active area of research um, all the way up to the professional level. Uh, there's also things like rotations and translations and unfoldings and foldings and all kinds of things that you could imagine doing in your mind's eye that are also relevant. Interestingly, we see that um, in many cases, uh, and frankly, almost all cases, it is also strongly connected to uh, the ability to gesture through these, uh, uh, basically to gesture out these shapes. This is a picture of a student who was working on the problem that I showed you on the previous page, creating a cross section of an, un well, creating, drawing an unknown cross section from a known surface projection. And he was actually sweeping out the shape of the, uh, the the sin form there, as well as uh, indicating the, the axial trace direction oriented, oriented in three-dimensional space with his pencil. And he did this spontaneously and quickly. And this is one example, but there are hundreds at this point of examples of um, evidence, pretty very convincing evidence, I think, at this point that um, gesture and uh, that kind of reasoning is strongly connected and that actually using the body as an extension of the mind is a key piece of geologic reasoning and probably ge ge um, physical reasoning as well. Largely, this is all tied up in the uh, field of embodied cognition. And so we're finding this is uh, a group of uh, psychologists, uh, cognitive psychologists, sometimes social psychologists. Oh, I'm hearing somebody there. So the, uh, the literature on embodied cognition has been very useful, and a lot of us have pursued this. Um, it is connected also to gesture and metaphor in an interesting way. So uh, anyhow, moving on. We also know that this is connected through into um, culture. And so we, can, uh, assess, we have the tools available to us to assess things like epistemology, efficacy, all these things that actually bring people and keep people in the geosciences. All right. Moving into the topic of today and really setting up Claire, because I know that uh, shortly we've got to move on to her. So I've got you know, a couple more slides I wanted to show you about some work that we're doing. I wanted to give a quick advertisement for the um, for an AAPG memoir that's out based on a June 2013 Hedberg conference that covers many of these issues. It's got a very strong petroleum focus, but a lot of this is involved in reflection seismology, obviously. Um, and so um, some of our, I think Tim Shipley from next week appears frequently on this one. Uh, so he's involved in this, so he'll probably talk about these things. Uh, and the research that I'm going to show you right now and that Claire's going to talk about next is uh, definitely connected through this work. I was at this meeting. We didn't contribute a paper to it, but it was a fabulous meeting of uh, structure of cognitive scientists, geoscience educators, and then people who design uh, software for manipulating seismic volumes. So advertisement for them. The work that's in progress here that I just wanted to share with you that's really inspired by Claire Bond's work and inspired by uh, and, and designed to complement it is looking at expert behavior, emerging experts, um, employment ready experts. This is a study focused on graduate students who have some petroleum experience that are either have done internships and are on their way into the oil industry for the most part. So these are employment ready people at the graduate level. So that's where this study is focused. Matt Jackson is my master's student. He's almost done. The work that you're seeing here uh, uh, is in progress. Um, it is uh, some of the charts that I'll show you, uh, I literally saw for the first time last week. So this work is you know, right in the thick of it. Uh, big thanks to Donna Shillington at Lamont Doherty for providing the data set for this. Um, we were initially intended to have some industry data available to us, but uh, the downturn um, took out some took out some connections that were it made it awkward to do that. So working with this NSF funded data um, was very handy in this regard. So thanks to her. So what we're looking at here is we're trying to understand workflow and expert behavior. Uh, we're trying to understand how people do uh, seismic interpretation, not so much are they good or bad, but what they do differently as a function of expertise. We have 10 participants. It's a qualitative study. And so we have in-depth interviews and observations of these 10. So it's actually a fairly large data set. Um, even though there's not very many people, they're evenly split between geologists and geophysicists. They're mostly master's candidates in a mix of classroom research and industry experience. This is, uh, and we've been able to classify them in the second column as uh, highly experienced to low experience. Uh, and it's been interesting to contrast that with their self-reports of their own ability, for sure. Uh, so what we're seeing, uh, what, what we did in the experiment, first of all, we started off with uh, two lines that were uh, select, we selected with Donna and her team. They process them for us, and we were able to print out two intersecting lines. Um, here you go. 
This is from the Eastern North America margin, but we didn't tell the students this. Uh, we gave them a locator map like this one that showed where the lines intersected, and we gave them paper, and we also presented them full-size PDFs on two computer screens. I'll show you the setup in a moment. What we did is we told them to just go ahead and start identifying and interpreting as they saw fit any features of interest and left it at that and walked away and let them work on this independently for 30 to 45 minutes as they needed. It was a short exercise. After that, we interviewed them all um, in detail about what they did, why they did it, and we also encouraged them to annotate their, their interpretations as they went. So the setup you're seeing is typical for this experiment. We had the two lines set up next to each other with the in intersections clearly marked. We had the same lines set up in the same orientations on the computers you can see behind this student. And we filmed every aspect of this. The image you can see is from a GoPro camera. The camera in the back was recording the screens and people's interaction with the computer. And we also had a GoPro camera in the ceiling. What we were looking to capture was order and workflow and choice of how people move through these problems. Not so much, what, you know, if, is it a correct interpretation, but really trying to understand the behavior as people are moving along. So this is the type of thing that we got. So that we then analyzed these paper copies that we got. We analyzed the interviews, and the richest data has actually come from analysis of what people did, so all the video data. So we used a thematic analysis approach to basically let, it's a qualitative analysis approach, to let the data tell us what, we, what was important. Uh, we really looked at the participant interaction with the lines and the notations and let that define the key features. We created a graphical rubric of the whole, uh, all both seismic lines, based on their output. And then we had two researchers, Matthew and another student in my lab, go through and independently code these. And we're then able to quali quantitatively check those for reliability against each other to make sure we haven't fooled ourselves. So this is a classic technique called integrated reliability in qualitative research. This is what we got, and I know you can't see all the details, and they're not important, but the fascinating thing is that this is literally crowdsourced. Uh, this is from all those students that's working on this. The green areas are regions in which they're working. There are specific horizons picked out in blue. You also see orange uh, markings for specific features that a number of them saw, and then the, the purple features are um, you know, what, are, what are interpreted as, as salt domes, but, but you know, is, we didn't tell them that. They, they told us that. These are also Gulf Coast um, petroleum geology students, so it's easy to assume that they might be used to looking at salt dive here. Anyhow, so what we've been able to use these two keys for is then to go back through and look at the sequence of events. What did they do first, second, and third? How did they deal with each one of these features as they encountered them? And we're starting to develop some very rich patterns that actually correlate to their experience level. And so what we're starting to see is some of the uh, emergence of a picture of what more expert-like behavior looks like compared to more novice behavior within the fairly narrow window of graduate level master's uh, students that have been uh, pretty well soaked in some of this uh, for a lot of their graduate career. So the results are definitely early days, and this is my uh, second to last slide before we move on to uh, Claire Bond. Um, so what we're seeing in the, uh, we're, we're seeing some difference in the use of pencils versus pens and confidence. We're seeing some strong differences in interaction with the actual physical paper versus the computer, and also the amount of time that people spent uh, assimilating the problem before they dove in and started doing um, some, uh, uh, trying to interpret the various structures. Uh, and this is typically, we've seen this in the field also in more expert behavior in general. You tend to have people sit back for a couple of minutes and just take in the totality of what they're looking at. We saw more expert students um, trying out ideas, doing some ghost tracing. It's Claire's term from her research, and we liked it, so we borrowed it uh, with credit. And it's um, you know basically hovering over a feature, kind of envisioning what would that look like if I interpreted it. And then did they use the computer or not? And we're still teasing out specific items there. Um, I think of all the things that we're seeing that are most interesting are the, um, the artifacts and the packages in the middle of the second list, right in, right in here. Um, experts, the more expert students definitely saw and talked about some of the features as packages rather than individual standalone entities. And that's typical of chunking behavior that you see in experts. And so um, what we're seeing is these behaviors start to emerge that correlate with how we think they should be uh, as members joining an expert culture of seismic interpreters. The geophysical students also were very quick to pick out processing artifacts, whereas the geologists really missed them. And that's interesting. That's a, it's a fairly straightforward finding that is not surprising, but it's nice to document it because that has direct implications for instructions. Uh, likewise, how people treated uh, direct hydrocarbon indicators and uh, 
we're still analyzing the frequencies of, of who did what in what order. Um, finally, um, I, I think, you know, so the workflow analysis is ongoing that I don't have for you because I think Matt's doing it right now as we speak it, <laughs> while he's also writing some of the other stuff. But uh, we are starting to see some interesting uh, distri uh, distribution of confidence versus our quasi-objective judgment of how experienced they are versus their personal assignment of how uh, experienced they are and then how that manifests itself in terms of self-confidence um, and interpretation. And we're looking at when they have used uncertainty in the process. I, I think Claire will talk much more about this, but um, we've been looking for evidence of wrestling with scientific uncertainty. So I, we're starting to see some strong connections to Claire's work, which I think is good. Um, and some, um, you know, I think it's adding to the existing literature that she and her group have produced. And we are starting to see scientific background translating into bias and approach. Um, and we're starting to see a separation in our data and behavior due to enculturation as sort of journeyman seismic interpreters compared to those folks that are more novice. And so this is interesting. And again, this, this study is meant to be a first step uh, testing this methodology um, we would like to move toward eye tracking with this eventually. Um, and I think, uh, you know, Claire's group is considering doing the same. And so that's good because we need more data on this. We need, I think there's much to be learned from attention um, on this. And so I'm also going to be collaborating with a group at Auburn on some of this and hopefully building out a team to look at this collectively. So that's where we are with this. And I would, uh, I would thank you for your attention on this part. Our methods are starting to provide some, some good data. Um, Collaborations are brewing and ideals for new ones are certainly welcome. Um, this is in a fairly narrow domain. This is just seismic reflection kind of with a, a petroleum exploration bent to it. There would be some interesting things to do that would be completely different probably in uh, global seismology or other applications of, you know, passive source or active source seismology. So uh, we're, we're open to some new ideas. Um, I think any computer-based tasks, actually, this type of approach is useful because you, we pioneered a bunch of techniques from field-based learning and navigation studies that are useful now on a computer screen. So with that, I'll hand it off. Um, I think I actually have to hand off my screen. Is that right, Stephanie? Or can you guys do that? Yep, this is Justin here. I'll go ahead and transfer okay. the, uh, the screen sharing over to Claire, and she okay. can get started with, with her presentation. Great. Is that good? Can everybody see? Looks great. Okay, excellent. And uh, thank you for that great introduction, Eric. I, I had to unfortunately come in uh, at the end of your talk, but um, I, I, th I think I, I, caught, I caught the right bit for me to uh, carry on from. So I'm going to talk a bit today about um, teaching uncertainty in science. So that's the kind of the angle that I want to come from. And as Eric introduced, I've been looking at this through interpretation of seismic reflection data. So I, I'm not sure how much of this Eric covered, but for me, um, geolo geological data sets tend to have this inherent uncertainty. They tend to be spatially limited for seismic image data. They're often collected or viewed in different dimensions as well so we've got maybe a horizontal um, distance scale and we've got a time scale on the vertical axis and um, we often combine these remotely sensed images with maybe some harder data like down on the bottom right where we've got some wells that are penetrating um, horizons so we might have like horizon top data which we then use to help us um, interpret this maybe more softer remotely sensed kind of seismic image data and so there's lots of uncertainty there's kind of objective uncertainties around the kind of data um, collection and processing that we maybe actually may be able to put quantitative numbers to um, but then there's also a subjective uncertainty that comes from actually interpreting the seismic itself um, you know the seismic image that we see is already a model it's already an interpretation based um, on processing of that seismic reflection data and I guess the point of the little geophysicist rock collection down the bottom is just to say you know for when you process a seismic image you have to make some assumptions about velocities and so you know the, those velocities that you use are, you know they're only as good as the the information that you have to start with but I'm um, 
going to cover a lot of topics um, as I go through the kind of 20 minutes now. So it is about teaching, it is about uncertainty, but we're also going to cover history and philosophy of science, a bit of psychology, creativity and human bias. And I want to start um, by using a field analogy. And I, unlike Charlie Brown in the little cartoon, I actually like field trips. So um, that, that's a good thing. And one of the reasons why I like them is because I think field work is a great training tool for geoscientists across the board, whether you're a geophysicist or a geologist or a geochemist. And why I like field trips is because I think they're a really good training um, it's a really good training environment for formulating and testing hypotheses. And um, this image that um, down on the bottom left, I pinched off the scrolling images uh, from the University of Glasgow's uh, science uh, department. And I like it not because the rocks are beautiful, but because the, um, the little tag that Jeff Tanner, who took the photo, put to it, and it, it says you know, twice folded quartzite beds in Donegal bog. And for me, the interesting bit is the Donegal bog because the rock's there and it's nice, but then you've got this bog surrounding it, and your next outcrop may be 20 meters away, maybe 100 meters away. And you're looking at the rock, and then you go to your next rock outcrop, and you look at that, and you start the first one and you build up a model of what you think might be happening you go to the next one and you somehow have to link those two data points spatially and the information that you get there and you have to build a model between them that makes sense and we do that all the time when we're making a geological map or building a cross section we're trying to um, build a model that works and we're formulating and testing hypotheses and it's often an iterative kind of cycle as we do that and as we do it, we're applying concepts, and these concepts may be based on previous experience. So there's a photo of me looking at some faults in Italy. They may come from textbooks, they may come from training courses, but we use all this information and we use it to help build these models and make our interpretations of the data. And sometimes as a geologist, we might have lots of rocks to look at, and other times we may have not so many rocks like maybe in this example but we still try and build a model and we try and make predictions in this case we wanted to drill a, a water well um, and when we drill it our predictions might not have worked so well um, so the message really is that often in geological data sets we've got um, a number of valid solutions so there are a number of reasonable possibilities some of the solutions we may say well that's it doesn't really work geologically, it doesn't fit to our geological reasoning or understanding, but actually several of these solutions might actually work. So there isn't a, often a unique solution based on the data that we've, we've got. So I said I'd talk a little bit about psychology and I wanted to flag up this paper by Tversky and Carmen, which was published in Science in 1974 on judgment under uncertainty, um, and th thinks about heuristics and biases. And um, why it's important is that I think a lot of the issues that they tackle in this paper are relevant to interpretation in geosciences. Um, and Carmen actually wrote a nice penguin book called Thinking Fast and Thinking Slow recently. And the, it's, it's a good read and the paper's in the back if you don't want to read the science paper. But it's, it's, a, it's a really interesting read about how we're all biased um, when we make these interpretations and how we use these little techniques or heuristics called rule, rules of thumb. And um, Carmen actually won a Nobel laureate for his his work on this with Tversky. So it's a kind of seminal paper and it's 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 worth a read if you're interested in this kind of the biases and, and rules of thumb. So there are lots of different biases um, and some of them are just simply which model is maybe most available to you at that the time that you're looking at your seismic image data. And then there's also biases that maybe have opposites. You might be a very like you know your personality might be such that you're a very positive person so you might think very positively about um an interpretation other people might be very negative so some of them are influenced by maybe personality traits and other things but there are all these different biases that will affect every one of us to different extents so why am i talking about biases uh, and that's because we're very good at humans of 
of using these little rules of thumb um, to help fill in gaps and that can be in imagery it can be in conversation and so i've just i've got three little images on the screen um, the first one you may look at and think oh there's four red circles and a white square but there isn't there aren't four red circles but our brain is trying to make sense of the pattern so we kind of imagine four red circles with a white square and the same for the central image it, it looks like it's got a green disc in the middle but actually they're just the spokes are just colored green but our eyes are trying to make it into a into a kind of a sensible pattern and and fit things like circles which are these little conceptual models that we have in our head oh that's a circle and we try and fit that information to the imagery that we're seeing so uh, on the right we've got just a series of black lines and we might think oh it looks like a rectangle the alternative is that maybe it looks like two triangles but we're probably less likely to put two triangles but it's kind of a more complex conceptual model and i guess the point is that this is what we're doing every time we look at seismic image data is that we're trying to fit these conceptual models um to the imagery so we're, we're trying to fit all these ideas that are in our head does, does that work does it does it make sense do, do, are the geometries right when we're interpreting seismic imagery so I've, I've put this up um, because it's a common little psychological test about whether you can see a duck or a rabbit and maybe you can flick easily between a rabbit and a duck and maybe you can't um, but again it's just our brains trying to make sense of the imagery into a pattern or a concept that we can understand easily so we're all biased but can we do anything about it and is it a good thing or a bad thing um, and those are some of the kind of the questions that i wanted to try and address and i'm going to try and address them by showing you four experiments that i've taken part or i've um, helped conduct um, and they're quite similar to the kind of exercise that eric was showed you at the end of his presentation and the first um experiment is really just shows you how subjective interpretation is and how um different things kind of build into that subjectivity experience knowledge personality psychology but it's not very easy to say it's this or it's that or in this instance this will have the most effect so um from the work that i've done it's not so easy to pinpoint right it's this personality trait that will win over it it's it really there are a lot of inter a lot of factors that are all build in together. So my first experiment I did when I was working at the University of Glasgow and with Midland Valley Exploration, and we had 445 geoscientists, we had one seismic interpretation experiment, and we just looked at how many different interpretations we got to that um, seismic image. Um, the seismic was created from a known model. So if you look at the black boxes on this side, um, you can see we start off with a layer cake stratigraphy and we have normal faulting and then the normal fault steps back and we've got sin sedimentation and then the whole thing is inverted so we get a thrust fault that cuts up and again we have sin sedimentation so we have this no model and then GX technology um, made as a synthetic seismic and that's what we then used for our in, um, experiment. So we also asked the participants um, to fill in a questionnaire a bit about their level of experience and expertise. And so they filled that in at the same time as they did the um, seismic interpretation experiment. And these are just some of the many different um, concepts or interpretations that we had to that one data set. So you can see there's a really quite a broad range um, lots of different things going on in different interpretations. You can see up here we've got these sticks, and I'll come back to the sticks later, which are a bit strange, but yeah. So very different, very different styles of interpretation and, and, and very different implications from these interpretations. And after I got all the interpretations in, I basically bin them into different kind of tectonic pots, if you want to call that. And you can see here, 23% had some kind of inversion, maybe not on the right structures, but they showed the inversion. 26% or more had a simple thrust. We had quite a lot of unclear interpretations. That was part of 
how I kind of bin the data. So you can see we have a real range of different models. And I was really interested. So we got this data and it's like, yeah, interpretation is subjective. We get a whole range of different interpretations. But what's the effect of prior knowledge? How biased were people in? And that was my hypothesis. And I was like, right, look, look at this. You know, is that MSc student bias? Well, maybe. And so there were these there was evidence within the data set that people were very biased by what you might call their most available model or what they were working on at the time. Um, but they were anecdotal. And if we looked at the whole data set statistically, nothing fell out. So then we basically took the people who said they were experts in structural geology or were proficient in structural geology, and that amounted to 184 individuals. So these are our experts at this end. And now we're getting 35% of those experts have got an inversion style interpretation. And we looked at those and we said, look, it's a structural geology problem. Let's see, if we look at those people, um, what happens? So, I took the experts and I looked at what techniques they'd use. So a bit like Eric, he had, you know, annotations, there's sticks, there's interpreting features, there's descriptive writing, there's thinking about the evolution. And what we found was that the more of these techniques that we used, the more likely people were to get the right interpretation. So to get inversions, this is just number of techniques along the bottom um, and percentage of correct interpretations. And then we looked at individual techniques. Um, what we found was that one particular technique stood out, and that was showing evidence of thinking about how the structure had evolved through time. So you can see the example here. We've got different numbers, and there's a little cartoon that shows you kind of how it works. So if you thought about the geological evolution or showed evidence about that, so think geological reasoning, really, um, then you were 94% got the right answer in inverted commas. And the the few that didn't kind of draw little sketches and their sketches didn't work. So even though they hadn't got to an inversion interpretation, they'd shown that their kind of model didn't work. And the statistically significant factors for structural geologists were having a master's or PhD, were annotating horizons and making annotations. But then this geological evolution was really statistically significant and you were 40 times more likely to get um, produce the correct interpretation if you'd use this technique. So I was like, hang on a minute, let's go back and look at the non-experts. So this is the data now for the non-experts, looking at the different techniques that they used. And you can see again, if you're a non-expert, but you used evolutionary thought processes. So if you're not a structural geologist, that those are my non-experts, you, you did you did really well. Um, so, and you can see that this, people who use sticks basically had no idea what they were doing and the same with the experts. So it's a it's a good thing to teach. Don't, don't teach people to draw sticks on seismic data. They don't know what they're doing. So um, yeah, it shows that basically anybody can do well if they use the right reasoning thought processes. Um, so that was our main conclusion was that this kind of idea of reasoning and thinking about geological reasoning was really important in interpreting the seismic. And I think quite shockingly for me, only 18 to so only 10% of those experts in structural geology showed any evidence of thinking about geological reasoning or geological evolution. And so we picked up on that fact in a second experiment, and this was called the Freyer experiment. And it was conducted by a PhD student of mine, Neil McRae, and it was published in Interpretation last year. And he again did a study where he got lots of people to interpret seismic image. Um, this time it was a real seismic image from the North Sea. But he ran a series of workshops in which half, in each workshop he got half of the group he asked them explicitly to describe the temporal geological evolution of their interpretation and he, the other half of the group weren't asked that so the, they were exactly the same and it was just random who got asked and who didn't um, but what we found was that those that were explicitly asked to describe the geological evolution were 4.5 times more likely to get a better score we kind of marked on a scoring basis um, and then maybe for me, what was even more interesting was when we talked, we kind of had a workshop kind of discussion afterwards that were those that hadn't been explicitly asked to describe the temporal evolution said, oh, no, I did. I thought about it. And I, but because they hadn't explicitly done it, it didn't really have any impact. So I think that's that was one of the nice findings from that study was that you really explicitly have to do it. You can't just think, oh, I do it. It, it like 
you have to really do it. And then the third little experiment, um, and this is, I did this before some of the others actually, but um, was it's quite similar to Eric's in that I was interested in how different cohorts approach data, approach seismic interpretations, um, and again, what kind of t techniques or workflows that they use. So I guess in some ways I was interested in this kind of lack of confidence in students and whether that was really a barrier to seismic interpretation. Because I think, you know, you get given a seismic interpretation, you're like, there you go, interpret that. And it's a bit like, oh, um, uh. so this graph shows um, four cohorts, an ultimate year undergraduates, final year undergraduate students, master students, and then professional geoscientists. And this is basically just shows the mean for each of those cohorts about how they felt. So this was um, asked after they'd completed their seismic interpretation, how confident they felt and whether they, how reluctant they felt to put pen to paper. And you can see there's no trend really at all um, in, in, in the data as it's seen. But I also videoed them. And so the video shows something quite different. Um, so rather than their now assessment on how confident they are, I've used different factors to assess confidence. So we've got the time taken in minutes of this side, the four cohorts, and um, we've got the time taken to do ghost tracing, which as Eric described is this kind of hovering over the seismic image, but not drawing on it, making pencil marks, and then using colored pens. And what you see is with increasing experience, the time taken to undertake all these activities decreased. And then the other thing that was really interesting was that the percentage of annotations increases um, as you get more experience as well. Um, and also the language used. So again, like Eric's work, we found that penultimate year undergraduate, an example is almost an anticline. I mean, you kind of hedging your bets really. Um, so the professionals were much more, it's this, it's that. And they use these annotations to really describe what their interpret what they were seeing in their interpretation and really give it a kind of a body I suppose what was interesting was that then afterwards we asked um, each group to describe their thoughts and feelings about their interpretation and um, this is where the undergraduate students were in their heyday and just like yeah I felt confused I was unconfident I was puzzled I was lost um, and the professionals did what the undergraduates did when you asked them to interpret the seismic, which was sit there and kind of chew the tops of their pencils and like, I'm not saying how I thought, no way. And just the language they used was very different as well. So the professionals was all about nothing really to do with their thoughts and feelings. It was all about the drata and you wouldn't drill on the basis of this. And so very, very, very different in terms of um, the way their different cohorts um, I guess responded to the types of questions um, that we're asking them and for me this all comes down to to kind of confidence and experience and I guess I was interested in what we can learn from that and then the final little experiment I'm going to talk about is um, whether how biased we are from models and concepts that we're exposed to early in our geological training careers, I suppose. And here are just some examples from um, some modern day earth science textbooks on faults. And I guess my background is structural geology, so I have this bit of a tendency to use structural geology examples. Um, and this work was conducted by a postdoc of mine. And so I think he took 10 common structural geology textbooks and he just looked at the introductory chapters as compared to the more advanced chapters for each of, of different type of fault, normal, reverse, strike, slip and inversion. And you can see in green, the first column is the introductory chapter and the second column for each fault is the advanced chapters. And you can basically, you basically see that in the introductory chapters, the models on the imagery shown is dominated by planar flat faults, block diagrams, that kind of thing. And then as you go more into the more advanced material, the fault geometries get more complex and they get curved. Okay. And so we did a little experiment with um, some master students and we got them to interpret a seismic image with a fault down the middle of it effectively before they did a two week kind of short course in structural geology. And then after they've done the course, so the top is pre-course, the bottom is post-course, and this is just all their fault interpretations overlaying on each other. Um, 
And this is the same data, just so you can see a bit better, but the post is the red lines, and this is the interquartile range of all the interpretations, and the pre is the blue lines. You can see the post is offset this way, and they were much, the default geometries that they used post course were much more curved in nature. And funnily enough, if we look at the material that they were exposed to during the master's course, a lot more curved faults, because it was a master's level course, were um, shown than um, planar faults. And so I guess the conclusions from that work, which have just come out in the Journal of Structural Geology, um, were that often we kind of go back to this kind of early early examples but then we can we can kind of locally bias so if we then expose a cohort to lots of examples of curve faults then they're much more likely to put kind of curve faults on so really tentative kind of conclusions on this really first study about the impact of early exposure to models and how that then kind of goes on through people's careers or how long that kind of influences what people do so teaching when there isn't a right answer what can you do um so teaching the importance of reasoning for me it seems to be really one of the key conclusions from the work that i've done and that doesn't have to be about geological evolution it can be about geological evolution but you know does it work is it reasonable do, do all the things make sense and you know can you really query the data and your interpretation together as a coherent whole so it's not just about this fault it's like does the whole thing work like when I, from top to bottom does it work um, and also for this, which was the original Odin experiment, you know, you could just use the concept of regional, you could find the regional on the seismic and you could say, right, the stratigraphy, the stratigraphy is below regional and above regional, it has to be inversion. And you can match that really quite nicely from both sides of the seismic image. So using some of these kind of reasoning techniques um, would really help people in that interpretation. Creativity, and I think this is a really difficult challenge, um, and that is to try and encourage multiple interpretations to, to data sets. So really kind of say to your students that, you know, there's subjectivity in interpretation, there isn't one answer, create me something different. And there's been quite a lot of work, the rabbit or duck or duck or rabbit, about the importance of creativity and creativity in science and people who are creative and cre can create multiple ideas, how effective those can be. And in a similar way, we also I also did some work where we used um, borehole data rather than seismic for, for the Odin seismic. So we basically took the Odin seismic and gave people a pseudo wells with tops and then just gave them those on a white sheet of paper. And what we found was that people used a lot more reasoning skills because they had to, because they couldn't just follow the data in the seismic, but you know, they weren't given this effectively piece of paper with a lot of color on it already. They were given these individual data points and they, they used a lot more creativity and reasoning skills to produce pretty good interpretations effectively with less data or with different data. And there's quite a body of work around um, having enough data and enough white space to be creative. So that's a, kind of an interesting thought about how we can make um, people be more creative. Um, so really think about when you're interpreting these geophysical data sets, the integrity of the whole, the whole geology, does it work? And I think there's a key message for students. For me is that you don't need to be a specialist, you just need to be able to apply the knowledge concepts, techniques that you have and reason, use this geological reasoning process. And then you need to be able to stand back and question the data and the model that you've created with fresh eyes and say, could it be different? Is there, is there another solution? And I'm going to leave you with this little quote from Robert Froedman. So Robert Froedman wrote a paper in 1995 on geological reasoning as a kind of history and philosophy of science guy. Um, but he really said this concept of geological reasoning, it's really important. It's not like in any of the other sciences and it's it's this this kind of reasoning skills are really important for a lot of 21st century social and environmental problems thank you great thank you very much claire um and uh and thanks as well to um to our other panelist eric at this time i'd like to open it up for any questions that folks in the audience might have um you're welcome to um use the control bar on your screen to send in a question or you can use the chat feature to just send a question um, that way as well. We did have one question come in for Eric. So Eric, if you're, um, if you're there, okay, great. Um, there was a question that came in about 
Um, let's see here. Okay. Uh, it says, did you observe any, um, any sketching um, uh, in, in any of the seismic interpretations, especially uh, representative of temporal evolution? Yeah, and I think uh, Claire went and answered that question with her fabulous talk. I mean, uh, actually, not really. Uh, with our with our group of students at this level, we don't see a whole lot of that kind of, um, you know. I think what what we need to look at is what's the uh, what's the length of the intervention, the length of the time, the length of time on task. Uh, and, but we did see. I, I think um, what we're seeing is, um, I mean, we our work was inspired and is following Claire's work. It's more advanced. Hers is more advanced at this point. And what we're after is really more of the actual workflow and sequence of events and how people are interacting with these materials and especially the three-dimensional geometry but no we weren't looking and we didn't we haven't seen exactly that sketching but it's pretty clear i think from uh, claire's presentation that uh, you do see that uh with her more advanced people i don't want to answer the question for you claire but <laughs> i think that question is probably best directed at you uh yeah so i i i think the more experienced people definitely use sketching and you you can kind of force sketching a bit so if you kind of really ask students to do it i think sometimes they'll struggle to start but i think it does help them and um, we did some videos of um some professionals doing um, big 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 regional seismic lines which were quite interesting but really quite a number of those sketched across the top what was going on so they when you said can you explain to me what you've now drawn they would they would then draw effectively you know, the kind of basic margin and what they'd actually just effectively interpreted so this again it's a bit like you're um speaking with your hands which i think a lot of geologists do um i, I think sketching is the same um for, for yep. a lot of people so yeah i think it's an important skill and it really really helps a communicate but b it helps the thought processes as well so it's yeah i think it's pretty yeah in, in, a, in a previous, uh, in other work that we've done in field-based problem solving, we have seen that directly. Um, so this this research that we've done with seismic lines hasn't got to that stage of sophistication, but uh, the field-based work um, is much farther along. And of, of the expert-like model building behavior, uh, sketches are critical as, and um, it, it's definitely engages all the machinery of embodied cognition in a way that you'd expect to see and so it's good to see that, and uh, it obviously it comes out of Claire's work nicely as well. But you see it in in field geologists and probably in a whole lot of other studies as well, if we if we look closely. So uh, a follow up question to that came in uh, with regards to sketching. Um, so what does this say about the over reliance on seismic data, especially for industry interpreters? <laughs> Go Claire. <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, that, that's your that's your wheelhouse directly. So, um, yeah, for me, the screen, the whole um, seismic interpretation on a on a workstation, which is what happens in industry, I think, is um, uh, is kind of an issue. And it's fine when you're like relate really down on the maybe the detailed reservoir scale and you're using things like attributes or whatever. Then that's different. But I think these big you know, exploration kind of lines and stuff, at, you know, gone are the days of the plotter in the corner of the office room. And I think a lot of geologists bemoan that. So I think actually the screen based interpretation is very constricted. And I know that a lot of um, companies are now beginning to allow things like effectively annotation and some some companies are beginning to actually kind of insist in their workflows that um, interpreters actually kind of annotate which you didn't used to be able to do in a seismic interpretation but say this is what i think this is or this is i'm not sure if this ties right here so they're actually beginning to leave a lot more i guess of legacy thought process i suppose mm. because i i remember doing some work once with bp and and it was an old field in the north sea and they were like they were pulling down all these old interpretations and the only thing they had was the date and the guy's initials, you know, JR 1980 or whatever. And it's like, oh, was that John, John? Ah, oh, I think he works in Azerbaijan, you know, and you, we have no insight into what JR was thinking in 19, whenever it was. So, and I think that that loss of information, you all you have is the final, their final solution. You have no idea what they were thinking at the time. And so I think a lot of software packages are beginning to pick up on that. But yeah, the being able to sketch that, yeah, it's, um, it's an interesting thing, really. I think um, 
but we're, we're, we're a long way from that in, in terms of software interpretation packages. Okay, well, um, we're just over an hour um, right now. So I think um, if there aren't any more questions, we'll go ahead and wrap it up. Again, a, a big thanks to our two presenters today, uh, Claire and Eric. And uh, for the rest of you out there, don't forget to tune in um, to the continuation of this webinar series uh, next week. Thanks much.